privacy and security is are just totally wrong. It's uh, really simple to put hardware backdoors. And in fact, you can anything you can do in software, you can do in hardware as well. I mean, we can go as far as, uh, for example, building a complete uh, web server which runs open, which is built in a CPU which has one single instruction, which does the complete web server, and then this web server will be co will be open source software which consists only of this one instruction, and all the logic of the web server will be implemented in proprietary hardware, and then these open source people can just say, hey, this is an open source web server, but the open source part is only one instruction. You can really go as far as doing that. I mean. You can do anything you want in hardware, even building a web server if you want. It's not a very good technical solution, so it's, it has only, uh, it has only uh, academic interest. But uh, that's something that is totally technical, po technically possible. So really, it's really important, I think, to focus on what uh, you can do in hardware. And some people think that the maker community is moving in that direction. But if you look at what projects are uh, popular in the maker community, I will just give two examples from Kickstarter because a lot of people from the maker community love Kickstarter. Uh, who, who of you have, has never heard of Kickstarter? Oh. So Kickstarter is an online platform for funding projects. So you put a goal of funding, 25, like here it's $25,000, and then people have to back your project, say, I want to make this donation for this project to happen. And if this goal of funding is reached, then the project happens and money is transferred to the initiator of the project. And if you look at what projects are popular on Kickstarter, among the maker community, which is really present on, in, on Kickstarter, uh, you can see, for example, the Makey Makey. Makey Makey, is a, it has been extremely successful. It has, it has got half a million dollars when it was only asking for $25,000. And uh, what it is, it's just a small uh, board which has an AVR CPU on it. And little uh, probes with alligator clips to this board. You see a few of them here. And it will make this, uh, the objects that you connect to the, the alligator clip to, they will become touch sensitive. So when you touch these objects, uh, the, this little board here will send a signal to your computer and it will emulate a keyboard or a mouse. So you can basically like uh, uh, draw something or create uh, whatever, whatever object you want based on metal or other conductive materials. And then when you touch this object that you built, it will, you can control your computer with it. And this has been extremely successful in the maker community, even though there is just, uh, it's very extremely simple hardware. It's not really something which will enable you to build more hardware. It's just a very simple device for, like, it's a toy, basically. And when you look at projects which are not toys on Kickstarter, that's what happens. This one is a very advanced open source 5 axis CNC router, which also con con contains a plasma cutter. You see actually the machine here. It's really serious stuff. You could really build a lot with it. You could build an Apple computer case if you wanted. Like a lot of people love Apple computer cases, but they have no idea how to make them. Well, the way to make them is to use such a machine. And makers do not really care. I mean, this guy asked sixteen thousand dollars and it got two thousand. So I think there is really a big problem of aesthetics and ambition in, in the maker community. And that's why I'm talking to you today because I really I'm really trying to make you aware of this fact that we need to change some ideas in the maker communities. We need to move away from the traditional ideas of hardware hacking, that it has to be cheap, that it has to be easily reproducible. Uh, I mean, it's time for the big stuff. So, I was talking about cheap logic design before. How to make a processor? Well, there are actually projects which uh, are moving in that direction, in the direction of uh, having open source chips, open source processors. Uh, the, probably the most serious one, the best known, is Aeroflex Geisler. They are behind the Leon 3 processor, uh, which has been used a lot in aerospace. It has, it really, it's really, really popular in aerospace. There are lots of space missions from, uh, from NASA, from uh, the European Space Agency, which include Aeroflex Geisler processors in it. And uh, uh, this complete Aeroflex Geisler processor is released under GPL. It was, I think, from 2000 or 2001, they really started. They are really pioneering. Uh, open source uh, logic design CPUs. But outside of the aerospace community, of course, very few people uh, know about Aeroflex Geisler. And it's quite a shame because it was, it's a very professional design. It's very, extremely good quality. And uh, actually, people can play with it. You can have uh, 
development boards for, for higher flat gate stores. The main problem is they are a bit complicated to use and they are a little expensive. There has been another similar initiative called Open Course. Uh, I think it was about the same time as uh, I reflect Geisler. Uh, open Course was not really backed by any company. It wasn't backed by any space agency. It was just a bunch of open source people trying to build a CPU. Uh, it didn't really work. It, op or open Course is more or less like something where everyone puts little hobby or student projects. There is no good professional designs or not good documentation like uh, Aeroflex Geisler is doing. And, uh, but the main advantage of open course is the designs were also a bit simpler than uh, Aeroflex Geisler. Aeroflex Geisler is, I would say, even if it's good quality, it's still a little bit heavy. You need a big, uh, you need a big uh, powerful computer to use it. You need uh, really to dig into lots of uh, configuration options. You need uh, a very high capacity FPGA if you want to implement with it. So basically, FPGA is uh, like a CDR for chips. If you want to experiment, it's very good. But you need a very good, big and expensive one if you want to really use efficiently Aeroflex Geisler uh, CPUs. So because of these problems with these two projects, I started my, I started my own, which is the third one here, Milky Mist. And Milky Mist is actually more than just chip design. We were actually building a complete product uh, using an open source chip design. And it's not a product which is just for, uh, for hardware hackers. It's also a product which, is used for, uh, which can be used for VJs, for video artists, to create live video effects during shows. And we are actually, uh, there are actually some people who use today this uh, Milky Mist One device to create uh, effects during concerts and other artistic performances. Uh, I have brought one here today, so I will be able to do a little demonstration. And this device uh, has open source everything. It has open source video synthesis software running on that open source CPU that I mentioned. It has open source PCB, so this, uh, the design of this board here is also released under Creative Commons licenses. It has open source mechanical design, so you can even reproduce the case of it. It's actually a case which is simple to reproduce, only made with a laser cutter. We didn't go for plastic injection because it's uh, relatively small volumes, so it made more sense to just use uh, traditional laser cutting. And the main uh, point that we have in this design is it has open source chip design, as I mentioned before. And contrary to uh, Aeroflex Geisler, it's much simpler to use than the big, big fat uh, Leon CPU from Aeroflex Geisler. And uh, the main drawback of the Milky Mist, it, it still has uh, a proprietary chip physical implementation. Uh, basically, when we, we have this uh, open source chip design files, they basically describe the behavior of the chip. And then when you want to make an actual chip out of it, you need to run them through what is called a logic synthesis program. And this logic synthesis program will turn the logical description of your chip into a schematics of logic gates and uh, interconnections. And this has to do, be done automatically these days because chips have become so much complicated that you cannot really place millions of transistors by hand. You need to raise the level of abstraction. And uh, for, to, for doing that, you uh, just write a behavioral description of the chip, which gets fed into uh, some automated software, EDA software. And this will just design the chip for you and automate lots of tasks. You couldn't have complicated CPUs, powerful CPUs, without this technique. And uh, that's what actually enables you to separate logic design from physical implementation. So Milky Mist has an open source logic design. But if you look at the physical implementation tools, these tools which uh, turn the logic design into actual gates and interconnections, it still remains proprietary today. And also, the manufacturing process of uh, the chip itself is also proprietary. In fact, we haven't made our own chips yet. We are using what is called FPGAs. FPGAs is like a CDR for chips. When you, have, uh, when you make a CD, when you, want, when you want to go to a CD press, you have to pay a lot of money up front to make the, your first CD, and then you can make lots and lots of CDs very fast. But you have really to pay a lot of uh, money for the master CD. And in the chip world, it's exactly the same. Uh, if you want to make the first chip, you would have to pay something like maybe $1 million if you have a very complicated chip. And then 
each chip will cost like only a few dollars and that's how you can make have chips for mobile phones which are so big and so complicated and still this mobile phone will cost only 20 euros it's only because of the volumes but when you have small volume products like the milky mist which has only sold 100 units uh, you cannot really afford to pay 1 million euro for uh, the first chip and then the products will cost 10 10,000 euros or even more sometimes so, so you cannot really do that so what we use is is an fpga an fpga is like cdr a cdr is more expensive than a pressed cd but you can rewrite it as many times as you want and it's exactly the same for fpgas when you buy an fpga you can buy them for a few companies like xilinx or altero uh, you will pay like a few dozen euros for the fpga but then you can load any chip design you want into it and uh, this is also something that is remaining proprietary in the milky mist and which is something which is the next frontier that we want to fix and there are actually some people who are trying to manufacture chips so this is an iron cat which is only a few micrometers high and that was meant as a test for patterning on photoresist. Basically, when you want to when you want to make a chip, when you want to engrave your chip, uh, you have this wafer of silicone. You spin coat it, which means you put a layer of uh, a photographic material on it, and then you would expose it with ultraviolet radiation to create very fine patterns, which are only a few micrometer high. And uh, after that, you use some chemical or physical treatments on your chip to, uh, uh, for example, oxidize silicone or add some uh, impurities like doping, what is called doping, to create silicon junctions, semiconductor junctions in the silicon. And this will only uh, uh, go where there is uh, no more photoresist. So, and you do that many times to create the different layers of the chip. And at the end, you can really. Uh, create a very complicated circuit with tons and tons of transistors by just having a very uh, a relatively simple uh, photographic process at the beginning. And uh, when I say simple, I just say it's doable in, uh, quickly for large volumes of chip because it's actually not so simple to create so many layers with so much precision. And this is what this guy is doing in, in his laboratory. It's called OMSIMOS. And, uh, is really manipulating the chemicals and uh, manipulating photoresist, manipulating uh, photographic machines to actually try to pattern, to make these very fine patterns on silicones. And it's not so advanced today. It's only capable of making uh, one layer of materials like this nylon cut, for example. But I think it is a very interesting project and I think it's something that deserves to be encouraged, really. Because then you can, if you, you really go in this direction, then someday you would hopefully be able to manufacture your own open source chips. And that's, I think that's something that opens wide uh, areas of innovation and also freedom. Another machine that you need for manufacturing chips is uh, what is called thin film sputtering machines. Basically what you're doing for that, you are, it's a basic process. You create a plasma of argon here. You accelerate the argon ions on the sputtering target. And then this, uh, this will expel some material from the target and this material will be get deposited on the chip or whatever you want it to. And this is what you need for, uh, uh, for interconnecting things on a chip. Basically, you, want, you, you need to deposit metal layers on a chip that you, need, that you want to pattern later. But to put the metal layers in the first place on silicon, this is with the type of machine that you need. And it's not a machine which is very easy to build because you need gases, you need high voltage, uh, vacuum. But I think that's a very interesting and very basic machine that uh, people should have more interest in. And it's also not only used for chips, but also for uh, touch screen surfaces. When you look at uh, iPhones, for example, uh, the iPhone screen is made of a grid of very small electrodes they are transparent electrodes. Actually, when you look at your iPhone screen with this angle, you actually see all these patterned electrodes on the screen. And uh, these electrodes are made from a material called indium, indium tin oxide, ITO. It's uh, a metal which is transparent. It's a material which is conductive and transparent. And it's used to make electrodes on touch screens. So the big, uh, the big 
innovation of the iPhone is this uh, wonderful capacitive storage screen, and it was it's entirely based on this thin film technology. It's really a, a very good application of it. So you see that you can actually have some uh, interesting innovations from uh, such uh, technologies. Uh, it's also used for basically LCDs when you want to make the electrodes uh, inside your screen to interface to the pixels. It's exactly the same technology. It's also used for uh, making the small layers inside the hard, the very modern and precise hard disk heads. You can really do tons and tons of things with uh, such sputtering technology. And I think it's a very uh, basic building block of a lot of modern technology that very few people know about. And uh, there, are some, there is someone, I only know one person who is actually building such uh, things in his garage. Uh, and we are looking forward to inviting them at uh, the EHSM conference at the end of the year. There is another very interesting project. Uh, have you heard of Copenhagen Suborbitals? Who hasn't heard of Copenhagen Suborbitals? Well, you see lots of people. Who hasn't heard of Raspberry Pi? Yes. So when I was talking about the wrong aesthetics of open source hardware, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, so Copenhagen Suborbitals is trying to make open source rockets and basically for suborbital space flight. They really want to put stuff in suborbital space flight by using open and DIY technologies. And I think that's a lot more interesting than just a very small proprietary computer on a board. Really, it is. So it really deserves to be better known. So you can actually go into even more uh, controversial areas and even build nuclear fusion reactors. These are actually pretty old devices. They are called the fusers. Uh, they are actually designed from the 50s. Uh, they don't really work as a fusion reactor because uh, you put a lot more energy that uh, you get out. But it's still a very interesting experiment, a very interesting physics experiment. It's also used commercially as a neutron generator. And this device actually was built by a high school student. He's in high school and he builds nuclear fusion reactors in his garage. And I think that's really admirable. There is even Beyond, uh, beyond just small DIY projects, there are big initiatives, even from large institutes like CERN. CERN has released last year the open source hardware license and a repository for open hardware projects. Uh, so CERN is really trying to get involved into the open source hardware scene because they think it fits well to their mission of dissemination of knowledge. They want open source hardware. So they are trying, a bunch of people from CERN are really trying to push it very actively and have this repository of designs. Uh, so on OHWR.org, you have not only the license, but you have uh, a few other interesting hardware projects. Uh, you have, of course, particle accelerator control boards. So that would be something that is very specific. But you also have uh, software-defined radio projects. Uh, you have communication projects. You have generic open source chip logic, logic design components. So I think it's a very interesting initiative as well that needs to be watched. In a way, I think it's really time to start rethinking about hardware hacking and really try to change the aesthetics that things have to be cheap, have to be mass produced, have to be easy to build, and really try to move into more uh, ambitious and more deep projects. And you are invited to learn about such projects at the EHSM Extremely Hard and Soft meeting which is a conference which is going to take place at the end of this year in Berlin. And uh, uh, it, it will really showcase all such projects, all projects which go into directions of uh, this awesome hardware hacking that no one really hears, hears about and no one's really interesting about, but I think really has the potential to actually make a change. So, I think it's time for a little demonstration of the Milky Mist, if you're interested. But before that, do you have any questions? Hello. Yeah, uh, this date, will this collide with the CCC? No, it will not, because CCC has moved to Hamburg, and we cannot afford, a we cannot afford the room in Hamburg. So, we are not going there. But anyway, I 
not sure if CCC has really the same topics as EHSM. EHSM is really focused on frontiers of open source and DIY, and CCC is more about security and politics. Anybody else? Is that conference open to the public? Of course it is, yes, uh, totally. I, I mean, uh, of course it is open. I mean, uh, I wouldn't be advertising here, it here if it wasn't open. So you are not only, not only it is open to the public, but you are actively invited to participate in the conference. So we are looking for participants and speakers. We have an open call for participation. So if you, are, if you have a very interesting project that you would like to propose, or if you know someone who is doing something great, then by all means, send us an email. Anybody else? Okay, if you want to show us the demonstration. So, now I will just have a little demonstration of this Milky Mist device, which is a video synthesizer built on open source uh, uh, CPU. You, you have some? No? Tires with you? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, yes. There, there, there. Yeah, so that's actually the user interface running on the Milky Mist 1 video synthesizer. Maybe I can, you can have a little look at the box while I demonstrate it. So this picture here is coming straight from the device. We don't have any computer here. It's entirely running on our free architecture. We have a USB mouse, USB keyboard. It's also running our own USB logic design, which has been actually pretty painful to do, I must say, because USB is such a big mess. To get compatible with all devices, it's... I mean, it sounds simple, but... Uh, you have so many variants of USB mice or USB devices. You with sometimes have they have integrated hubs or things like that, and it can be quite a pain to support everything. But in the end, we managed to get things working. So, but that's the main point of Milky Mist. The main point of Milky Mist is to create video effects for concerts, and it's also meant as a hacking hardware hacking platform, advanced hardware hacking platforms for people who want to dive into cheap logic design. So, what sort of effect can you do with Milky Mist? Basically, you you can. The main strength for the Milky Mist is to be able to create uh, live effects with a very little latency. It's not like when you have a computer, you have this USB webcam which has had some delay and all that thing. Uh, the Milky Mist is very tightly integrated, very small, and it has very little uh, response time. So it's great when you want to have experimental uh, VJ shows which really play with interaction with public or dancers or performance. So what sort of effect can you do with it? I'll just open one of those. So you actually have a little programming language embedded inside the Milky Mist device itself. And this little language here defines the effect. And I have my camera here, which is connected. And I will just run the image of the camera through the effect. Maybe I should have some more, more uh, light. So it's like a little bit of a digital kaleidoscope. That's another type of effect you can do with Milky Mist. So people have been using it for a few shows already. In uh, there is, we have one VJ from New York 
uh, is called No Carrier and is really making totally great shows with it. Sometimes it's actually connecting a computer to it, uh, running some old school demos into the effects, mixing it, mixing it with cameras or generative effects from, from the device, and it, it creates really cool stuff. Uh, you have uh, what else can I show you? Uh, yeah, you, you can have totally gen just generative effects. Which do, they look a, li a bit like a screensaver, so it's not so interesting. But it can get good if you make them interact with music or with cameras. And everything is, again, totally programmable by just typing these lines of code on the device itself. You have this keyboard here. It's a regular USB keyboard. So you don't need a computer at all to uh, use the Milky Mist. You just uh, connect the screen and keyboards and mouse, and you're all set. Any questions or things you want to see? Or You can, if you want, you can also come here and play a little bit with Milky Mist. Or if you want to try writing effects, you want to see how to make effects? OK. So I will start with a blank effect. The blank effect does nothing, a black screen. Now I will add some uh, footage from the camera. The camera is actually drawn with what is called an alpha layer, which is just uh, taking the picture from camera and drawing with uh, semi-translucency into the current frame buffer. And the default uh, transparency of camera is zero, which means camera signal from camera is not drawn at all. So I will set this parameter to one. So uh, can you read what I wrote? I just wrote video underscore A equals to one. And when I run this, it takes the picture from camera and draws it over and over again. And since it's just adding picture, at the end, it becomes all white. So after a while, it becomes really boring. So I need to clear the screen a little. To clear the screen, I have another parameter called decay. And the default value of decay is, is one, which means there is no decay at all. The screen just stays as it was before. And when I set it to zero, it will clear the screen completely between each frame. So what it's, what it's doing now is just a very pass-through device. It does just displays from the camera. Yes, question? Do we have another microphone? Uh, do, you have an, do you have another? OK. For programming mil milk, ah, for programming this, uh, uh, all I need is uh, to set variable. Mm. So yes, everything is based on setting variables. But you can actually have variables which are changing with time. You can actually put equations into the variables. So that's what I'm going to explain now. So. Instead of just having, instead of just clearing the screen completely and drawing the video completely, we can start doing a little effect by having intermediate values. Oops. So instead of having one, which is just drawing the picture without any opacity, I will just have, let's say, 0 0.7, 0. Uh, 0.5, which says draw the video with 50% opacity, and maybe even 0.3. So 30% opacity, and I will not clear the screen completely between each frame. So we will, we will have a little bit of the previous frame when the new one is drawn. And when you run this effect, you have a little motion blur effect. You see, when, when I'm moving it, you see that you still have the other frames which are remaining. And maybe I should try to have more brightness on the camera. Ah, that gets better. But that, that's a very simple effect. We can start to do some more serious things now 
by not only uh, clearing the screen, but also zooming the screen. So here I'm zooming the screen 2% each frame. And that's what it's doing. I can also, instead of zooming, I can rotate it as well. That's a lot of rotation. <laughs> so even parameters which do more fancy effects, like warp. Warp really turns the picture inside out. Uh, you can also, as I said before, not having just static variables, but variables which are changing with time, or even with audio or MIDI controllers or whatever device you can connect to the Milky Mist. It has a lot of interfaces, actually. You can connect it to Arduino boards, computers, whatever you want. So, but I will just make a little uh, sine wave pattern which changes zoom, so it will zoom in and zoom out alternatively. So what I wrote was zoom equals 1 plus 0 0.1 times sinus of uh, time variable multiplied by 3. And the time variable is just counting the seconds since uh, the effect was started. I multiply it by 3, I take the sinus of it, so it becomes an oscillating pattern. I scale it to between 0 0.1 and minus 0 0.1, and I add 1, so this becomes oscillating between 0 0.9 and 1.1. And that's what you get. You like it? So you can, of course, do the same with the rotation. So now it's rotating from one direction and the other. Okay, so you have actually lots of variables to play with. I think there are something like 100 variables like that that you can combine, you can uh, make reactive to audio, make reactive to video, to controllers. You can actually uh, connect uh, MIDI keyboards MIDI co or MIDI controllers to, to the box. And then you have sliders or, uh, or tablets. And when you move, you can interact with the variables in the effect. So you can change anything you, I mean, you can really create interesting experimental performances with it. And for hardware hackers, it's the best, probably the best platform you can think of if you want to do any sort of cheap logic design or play with uh, a very open embedded platform. We will actually have other talks about uh, other type of open source CPU designs at the EHSM conference at the end of this year. And you are, of course, invited if you, have, if you are interested in these sort of projects. Questions? Hey. Nice to see you there. Thanks. Another good friend on the stage. <laughs> um, can you talk a little about the projects you did for CERN and NASA? 
What is exactly what you what you were collaborating? Yes, I actually did collaborate on uh, the CERN OSWR.org uh, website. I just I designed uh, stuff from CERN as a consultant to uh, contribute to the Open Hardware Repository Workshop, uh, open, hardware, open Hardware Repository website. And uh, I'm also very pl pleased to announce you that uh, actually uh, some Milky Mist uh, components are being reused by research institutes. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, NASA launched into space uh, a device which contains the memory controller that I was originally designing for the Milky Mist device. That's what my involvement with CERN and NASA is about. More questions, sir. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, are there any plans or like how feasible it is to use that APIs to make it work with more real-time data, like streaming audio to make or sensors <laughs> or stuff like this, not only video, but other like streaming data. Uh, like for example, uh, in microcontrollers that uh, in what? I used in robots, for example, to coordinate movements, mm -hmm. it's like uh, really, uh, the logics are somewhat close to the video processing. It's like you have an input of data mm -hmm. and you have the, the filter that uh, will drive the motors and mm -hmm. stuff like this. So, okay. is it an, an API that we can like use later on for this kind of stuff? Uh, actually, there will be there is an API in the next version of the chip logic design. Uh, right now, I'm working on a tool called MyGen, which uh, is another level of abstraction for logic design. And this tool will be able to uh, turn uh, some sort of algorithms into hardware automatically. And so if you need something which, adds, which has performance, so if you have uh, digital signal processing filters or image processing filters which are very expensive in terms of computation, then yes, I can encourage you to try using MyGen for uh, building the hardware acceleration for your robots. Uh, actually, MyGen is used for, uh, today for uh, not only the next version of Milky Mist, but also for uh, signal processing applications in radars. Because this takes a lot of processing power and it needs to be put in a very small form factor. So we are working on their work. They are reusing technology from Milky Mist to implement the chip processing, uh, the processing chips for the radars. But if you have just a simple robot, then I'm not sure if you really need that much processing power. What what sort of processing do you need actually? Uh, well, most uh, what uh, first think about like audio processing, like high quality audio processing in real time, and effects. But then I thought, well, uh, well, a modern robots has like 200 motors. Yeah, because uh, if you want to have a really smooth movement, mm -hmm. you need to control everything in real time. It, uh, like 10 milliseconds, it, it will uh, start to shake. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, well, a, a really simple like microcontroller uh, can move a small robot like a doggy, yeah? but a big Android one mm -hmm. uh, would be like uh, ugly without but, a really but, uh, quick but processor. How, how much computation needs to be done in 10 milliseconds? Well, I think it's not like very much, but uh, uh, the problem is, is uh, speed. You need, really need to have like uh, almost two millisecond response yes, time. Yes, but I mean, millisecond response time, you can have it with even a simple 8 bit uh, AV or microcontroller. I mean, uh, well, uh, if you don't have a lot of computation, you can have uh, microsecond response time on, on an AV, for example. Well, uh, the thing that I don't really like, like on lower level proprietary controller, is like. Um, you have to study all the mm, proprietary stuff, yeah, mm -hmm. and you're like locked in a box. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything much more than the vendor wants you to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you like have a, a, a small problem, uh, uh, you want to do something, and then you want to make it bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, well, th there comes the design issue. It wasn't mm -hmm. designed for this, so you have to look for another solution and another solution and so on. So uh, Wh what I think it, it would be interesting to like, uh, having this open source hardware API, yeah, you can uh, build on top of it and make it uh, and grow it as you need. Uh, what, what, what controller are you using today? Um, well, right now I'm not using a controller. What? I'm, more, I'm more like in a little bit another area of competence. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking like combining uh, motion sensors 
with uh, some mobile web applications. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was like, oh, it could be cool. Have you looked at uh, a software called ROS, Robot Operating System? I don't know if it's good, I just know the name. Mm -hmm. And I know it's open source, I think it's Linux based. And I think it doesn't seem impossible for me to have 10 millisecond response time on a Linux system. So maybe you should check out ROS and just implement it on some development board, which might be based on Milchemist or not, as you want. Okay, thanks. R ROS, it's called. Robot Operating System. Um, anybody has any other questions? Uh, with Milkinist, I can uh, write and run my own C code. Uh, yes. Or I just uh, or Actually, I can use only uh, the static variable. This application that you see here, which is interpreting the code that you write here, is written in C. But I can so write my own C code. Of course, Milkinist is open source, so you have the source code for this application here. So you can totally modify it, and you are even encouraged to do it. Oh, thanks. Um, this was a 2D example. Um, ca can this machine or some machines uh, y you may build for a million dollars uh, um, make it in 3D? Yes, if you give me one million dollars, I can design a 3D machine for you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, wh what, is your, what is your project exactly? Um, it's the, just a thought in my head and I have to get it out mm -hmm. sometimes. But yes, I mean, we can totally build on this technology to improve it and build things which are 3D, yes? It just takes time and we need to have a very clear picture of what it's supposed to do. Like, uh, because I see the people are leaving, so I would just like to use the opportunity and say thank you that you came for this talk. And like, uh, I'm working also for the conference, EHSM, and I would really like to encourage you to spread the news about the conference to all of your contacts. We really believe in this people power whispering marketing. So please, like, if you can email to all your contacts, this conference will be really cool. And yeah, if you are interested in this stuff, you will enjoy it for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. In about 10 minutes, we continue with Arduino, with David Cortez. So grab a coffee and be back on our stage, everybody's favorite stage, Galileo, where the coolest stuff happens. <laughs>